remember there is a there is a place in the agenda under public comment for any non-voting members to contribute or ask any questions. So we Sorry will move around from there. No worries. <laughs> so we will move right into project update from Nancy. Do we have any CenturyLink phone folks on the phone? Yeah, this is Stephen Doyle. I'm from CenturyLink. This is Paul Brown yes. from CenturyLink. Yeah, hey, Bruce, this is Wes. Nancy is on the phone, so she should be able to access and she will give the update. Okay, Nancy, star six to unmute yourself. And a reminder for everybody, if you have to put us on hold, be sure and mute yourself with star six before you start playing your on hold music for everybody on the call. Nancy, are you there? Gotta unmute. I am. Okay, can you uh, start us out with the project update? Sure. I've been meeting with the various PSATs. We've been reviewing the site requirements. Um, I'm going to follow up for those outstanding requirements weekly. And we've gotten all the way met with all the PSATs through March that are cutting through March. Okay. And um, I've been, yeah, updating the uh, user spreadsheet too. Okay, great. Are we still on track to begin, what was it, January 7th? So far, so good. Yeah, we're still working okay. on the CenturyLink infrastructure, but at this point we haven't reached any uh, stop. Okay, great. Does anybody have any questions for Nancy? I do. This is Kimberly. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yes. Okay, great. So from our meeting last week, we discussed the need for CenturyLink to go back around to the PSEPs that are cutting to do a second visit on site to firm up the demarcation, the site requirements, cabling, location of the rack. When are those meetings going to be complete, at least for those PSEPs that are cutting in January? Um, we've only we've done a couple. We've gone back to a couple sites. We went back to Longmont yesterday, um, and we went to another one last week. Um, the majority of PSEPs don't have any concerns. The uh, DMARC is pretty straightforward, but the ones that we did have concerns, we have uh, made arrangements to go back. Kimberly, example, was there some wasn't there some discussion about your DMARC and uh, at the placement of the equipment? Wasn't Set, set in stone yet? Not right, at all. The, not at all the sites. There was only one or two sites that they, that we were concerned about um, the length of the DMARC and whether there was cable between our DMARC and theirs. But um, the majority of the ones I've met with is pretty clear, straightforward that the DMARC is right next door or in the room with the equipment. Right. I I thought it was in Loveland that was specific to Kimberly. Yeah, we have some concerns, but we don't cut till September, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay. I was just wanting to make sure that if the meetings were required, site visits for any of those that are cutting in January, February, that those are complete. Yes, and, and as I said, we've gone back to a couple of them just to clear up. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? This is Daryl. Um, Nancy, or maybe this is for Wes, but... Um, on changes to the schedule, I don't know that I've received anything else. Uh, I know that a couple of, of uh, other 911 authorities have requested to move their items. Uh, I know, for instance, uh, City of Pueblo asked to, to move theirs to the end. Um, as you guys make changes or agree to changes, can you make sure to include me on that, um, on that communication so that I, I have an up-to-date list of when everyone's transitioning because I'll need that for the grant process? Of course. Of course, either Wes or I will. And who was that speaking? That was Daryl Branson at the Public Utilities oh, Commission. Yeah. Yep. And then, then I think as, as well, CenturyLink files uh, schedule changes once a month with the PUC. Is that correct? Um, I remember the order required them to file an update on October 1st, which they did. I don't know that it requires them to file um, regular updates after that because the idea was that they would be communicating that through the users group. 
Okay. okay. But I can double check that on the order. Yeah, Wes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm actually in Montrose right now and uh, meeting with Mandy and Matt and to um, validate that they're okay moving up to November of 2020 from their their uh, January 7th, 2021. And so now that we've, uh, we haven't got the right date in November for them. So I wanted to nail that down and then we will notify and talk with Pueblo PD about moving them into the 2021 slot that Montrose has, which is January 7th, 2021. So as soon as that's done, I anticipate all that getting worked out in the next day when after I drive home, uh, I'll send you an update. Thanks, I appreciate that. And the only other thing, Darryl, we did slip um, Boulder a couple of days out to the following Tuesday of that week, so they're not on a, and um, Kimberly's course is in September next year. I think everything's been pretty much worked out, but I'll give you the update. Thank you, I appreciate that. So it doesn't, I don't really know that there's any more on the project updates. There's been I, no installs. So yeah, go ahead and Kimberly. Um, so to, yeah, I just had a question because there's deliverables that CenturyLink owes the PSEPs that are gonna cut mm -hmm. so many days out from their cut. And with the holidays coming up, and then I think CenturyLink has a moratorium of, you know, they're not doing certain work. So those PSEPs that are cutting in January specifically have has CenturyLink delivered the the IP addresses and and all of the network details and the project documents that you were going to deliver to those PSAPs. So basically, do they have what they need on their end to configure their firewalls? Do they have the ports? Do they have the protocols that they need to be able to let CenturyLink through their firewalls, et cetera? Hey, Kimberly, this is Wes. Um, Nancy, I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, there's still the firewall mapping needs to be done. They're working on Aurora right now. And so to be followed with Bretza, we've had discussions with Bretza and their their uh, consultants, et cetera, and that will be done very, very quickly as well as then ADCOM. And we've got calls set up with them here in a couple of weeks to get that done. They are all Vipers, by the way, so we're going to be pretty comfortable with the January mapping needs. Okay. Because and, and the just to be clear, uh, Kimberly, this is a good one. Um, you know, what we it's not like we shut down the company between Thanksgiving and, and New Year's. It's just we don't like to do network migrations during that time because of vacations on our side and y'all's. Uh, in case there's any troubles or things like that, you want you want there to be full staff to deal with any issues that come up on both sides. So it's just the network transitions. You know, obviously we will still be working on uh, the work that leads up to that. You know, the deliverables that we've been talking about, those will happen between now and, and New Year's, but we just have that moratorium on network cuts uh, as a general rule for, for reliability, safety, and uh, avoidance of surprises. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarity. Yeah. Uh, uh, clarity have, might be a little bit uh, generous, but sure. <laughs> Do we have any further questions or comments about the project update? Well, this is Wes again. Hey, Kimberly and uh, everybody. We are uh, hiring a program manager, too, for additional oversight into this. And um, I just talked to the hiring manager this morning, and um, he's got an offer out. So we will have additional support. To, uh, to cover all the needs of touching the customers, getting sure all the stuff, we dot the I's and cross the T's on these kind of technical details that need to be filled in. Thank you, Wes. Bet. Yeah, and Wes, if you just want to provide us their name and contact information as soon as that person is hired and ready to go, that would be wonderful. And we'll start including them in the emails. Um, you good? Yeah. I guess Bruce. Before you move on, I would mm -hmm. just want to. I would want to just give the floor to Aurora, Adcom, and the Boulder Peace Apps to see if they have any questions or concerns about the deliverables and their cut since they are our January go lives. Great idea. Yeah, great idea. Do we have any folks from those from those authorities or Peace Apps on the line? 
Yeah, this is uh, Rob Greer from Aurora. Uh, Hi, I do have some concerns about, but we haven't got any equipment from CenturyLink. We did uh, discuss it yesterday in our, our little uh, weekly meeting, but because um, I said that we'd probably get them two to three weeks out, but like you said, they're they're during those holidays, but I'd like to get them as soon as possible to actually to do uh, some uh, testing on that since we are going to be the first one. And Entrado is asking for, uh, you know, testing dates and uh, to get those uh, IP addresses and stuff so they can start configuring. That's the only concerns I have. Uh, this is Patty with Boulder. Hi, Patty. Um, I get, we have one. It, it kind of came in as a late request, so I don't need know that it needs to be discussed here. But we've certainly we've looked at asking CenturyLink whether we can be deployed over uh, the fiber that we currently have instead of T1. So I don't know what the outcome of that will be or what positive or negative consequences there might be from that. And again, that was uh, more of a late uh, question to CenturyLink, so. I, I guess I'm very curious in, on that question, and then we can circle back to Rob's comment. Wes, is CenturyLink entertaining fiber versus T1? Because I would say if, if CenturyLink is looking at making that switch. I know Pueblo brought that up. I know that Lita has CenturyLink fiber from an abandoned MO. So is that something that CenturyLink is <clears throat> considering doing for Bratza? Hey, can you hear me, Amboy? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, yeah. No, we are we're going ahead and uh, the Bratza, the Longmont PD, and they're already being provisioned, so we are sticking ahead with using that same median across the board at this point. So you can, these uh, circuits, fiber, copper, you can run a DS1, a, a digital um, copper or fiber. You can run, a T, a T1 is really not a thing anymore. Um, but if folks talk about T1s, uh, what we're provisioning here as far as the uh, egress circuits that will terminate at the PSAPs are DS1 level circuits. They're not T1s. Some of our some of our engineers and folks will talk about T1s because they're essentially the same capacity, but T1 is really the older kind of technology for these circuits. They're they'll digital work spans. On, they'll work on, yeah, they're digital spans and they'll, and they'll run over copper or fiber. I know Newton always says T once. <laughs> okay. This is Ed from Lita. I'm not, I'm not sure we got, or I didn't understand a, a clear answer on that, whether we can potentially um, provide these circuits over existing fiber. And, and no, we are using most of these through uh, X, almost up through August now. The orders are, are in and being provisioned over those digital spans, not fiber. But again, it's to Tim's point is th that that's fine. That actually, the, the digital spans are what it is. That's the medium that is very effective. Did that, I'm, and I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot who asked that last question about to clarify. Did did that get the clarification you needed? Yes, it's Ed from Lita, and that did clarify the okay. answer. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And then I think we need to circle back to Rob from Aurora about yes. equipment not arriving, and they need the equipment so they can do testing. And Trotto needs to do testing, and they need IP addresses so they can do testing. So, Wes, do you have, or Nancy? Yeah, I actually talked with Scott early this morning, and uh, and we will be addressing moving that, Rob, we're going to be moving that equipment in earlier. Sorry, I was traveling yesterday. I wasn't on that call, but when I talked to Scott, I became aware of that. 
So we will adjust it. And I want that in earlier too. I wanted it in closer to early mid December for testing for the same reason. And the mapping, uh, Kevin is orchestrating that for the Viper interface. Wes, do we have deliverable dates on, on the mapping and the equipment? Do you have a? I, no, I do not, not yet. Nancy can coordinate all that. I, I just became aware of that this morning when I was speaking with Scott the, to move the delivery of that equipment up. Yeah, and Kevin's working on it. I've gotten communications from him. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any other items we need to take care of it in this portion of the agenda for the project update? Hearing nothing, I think we will move right into the CenturyLink presentation that was scheduled for today. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Kim Haig with Entrada. I'll try joining um, your WebEx again. Um, it's not, it has not been allowing me to log on. Um, like I said, I'll try again here. And I'll click to present now. Okay. You'll have to tell me if you it's, can... It's saying you're presenting now. I don't okay. see anything other than your name. <laughs> okay, so let me go to my document and see if you can see this. Okay, are you able to see, it's, it should say at the top, IEN voice bridged call summary. Are you able to see that? Not yet. And it just says, it says you just left the meeting. I don't know if you just got logged off. I bet I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, it's the firewalls are not allowing me to to present. So the only thing that I could suggest, um, I don't know how easily it would be for for this call, um, that I would send out my own um, WebEx um, to be able to share my screen and and walk through these reports for you. Um, that's the way I wanted to do it um, because looking at a live screen. And for me to be able to, you know, point to the different areas and show you all the various drop downs is much easier to understand than to try and, and put all of the drop downs in a in a document. No, Kim, um, it, it's harder to flow. Through. Kim, Kim, that's fine. Kim. Why don't you just send that to Daryl, and then Daryl, maybe you can just share your screen with all. Exactly, of us. that's what I was going to suggest. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, thank you. So send it to daryl.branson at state.co.us. Okay, so the, the thing is that I don't have a document prepared um, because I thought I was going to be able to share my live screen and show you all the you, information. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what we're saying is create a WebEx, send that to Daryl. We will oh, okay. stay on this one, and he will share his screen showing your screen to the rest of us. Okay. And we're okay. going to link our we'll, – we'll link our web – webinars here. Oh, all right. Okay. And Daryl, when she was in, uh, did she have to then share her screen? Yeah, she tried, and then it logged her off. Apparently, she's having trouble with her firewall. Just a moment. I'll get the information sent to you in just a moment. Sorry for the okay. delay. While she's working on that, should we all sing happy birthday to Bruce? Because I think it's his birthday tomorrow, according to these chat messages. Yay. <laughs> no. No singing is necessary. Thank you, though. Okay. Thought I'd be polite and ask. I appreciate that. 
<laughs> and many more. Daryl, aren't you with Espion? Why don't you uh, give us all a happy birthday serenade here, huh? <laughs> there you go. Musicals were never my forte. I'm more of a fall down on the stage and make people laugh kind of actor. I do that in job interviews, don't I, Kimberly? <laughs> Actually, I was thinking the opposite. <laughs> 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 kind of a rock star approach is what I would call that. Hey, Daryl, I've sent an meeting invite. I'm trying the link now. Let me share my screen. And I don't think we need the audio, so we'll stick with a desktop still, client required. It's still connecting on my side as well. Okay. Boy. Mm. Not going to work. Um, I'm I'm going through an installation process here. Oh, gotcha. Let's see. Wouldn't it be something if uh, my webinar is blocked by her firewall and hers is blocked by mine? I was going to say, and if if we can't get right into it and it's going to take a little while longer, maybe we can move on to the discussion items and then come back to the presentation to see if we can get it. Okay. Well, it looks like maybe we're getting there, though. Oh, good. There we are. Okay, I think we are seeing what you're seeing now, Kim, finally. Okay, good. So at the top of the screen, you're seeing IEN voice bridged call summary? Yes. Yes. Okay, all right, so I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Um, when the PSAPs or the state authorities, however you want to um, approve, or who has approval to view all the metric reports, um, what we need to keep in mind is that my view and my options are going to be a little bit different um, than a PSAPs or, or the counties or the states just because I have access to everything. Um, so, you know, we'll give you uh, the proper logins and how to get um, into the systems. I'm not going to go over that at this point in time. Um, we do have our IEN voice um, metric reports. We have a standard suite of reports. And as you can see, everything is a drop-down menu. And so just from your um, contract, what Wes Horn sent me, there's eight metric reports um, that are called out in there. So I'll just review those eight, uh, keeping in mind that there are others available as well that we can always 
um, provide access to if there is a if there is a need. The first one in um, the system is called the Bridge Call Summary, um, and so I'm going to click on that, and then I'm going to go over some highlights. Um, some of the features that you will see in every single metric report as soon as this pulls up. And this is something that I won't go over on in every report. So up at the top, we have the frequency. Um, and right now, it's clicked on daily. And you have a weekly and a monthly view as well. So depending on what you choose there, then you can choose your date range, You know, if it's a day or a week or month. Um, you, you're also able to choose um, your time zone um, because obviously we have customers from one end of the states to the other. So we have all the various time zones in there. Um, and then also, um, again, this is my view. You know, you, you, you would only see Colorado data. You would not see Arizona, Minnesota, or any of the other states. Um, and you'd be able, so yours is going to be automatically on Colorado. Um, and then you're also able to view, um, you can view at a state level, all this information at a state level, or you can, there will be the drop down for the PSAPs, um, and that would, it would, the drop down isn't going to work because I'm, I'm clicking all the states right now. Um, but you would be able to do a drop down for the PSAPs and click on every individual PSAPs to acquire the data. Um, so I'm just going to show it as as um, Kim? A state level. Yes. Quick, quick question. Uh, because we are, don't have a statewide 911 authority, it's uh, more local 911 authorities. Will that also be restricted down to the authority level? So I can see my six PSAPs, but I can't see Kimberly's PSAPs. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yep, and we can say, you know, and all the PSAPs can individually just see their own. And then, like you said, if you, you have authority over six, somebody else has authority over eight, they would be able to see those six or those eight only. If there is somebody that comes on board at some point in time that would have the authority to see the whole state, then they get to see the whole state. Um, we can um, program that any way that it needs to be for individual case basis. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is the bridged call summary. So I'm, I have, like I said, at a state level right now, but it would be the same information if we clicked on an individual PSAP. And that I don't want to do right now just because I don't want to give out individual PSAP information. This is live data that we're looking at. And so that why I, that's why I'm just going to keep it at a state level. So you have your, your fixed um, calls coming in. You have selectively routed and you have manual. So let's, and another thing that we need to keep in mind is that some of the terminology will change. When you, when you hear words like bridged out, bridged in, um, kind of correlate that with transferred out, transferred in. So you have all of your uh, calls coming in. Uh, let's look at your bridged out for Arizona. Um, the total calls uh, for, the, for a day um, is here. We'll, we'll take a, anytime you see a blue highlight, like I'm seeing here in under total calls or fixed, or manual, those three entries right here, that means there's more information behind that. So let's take a look at uh, the total calls for Arizona. Now we'll take a minute for it to paint. <coughs> Excuse me. While we're waiting on that, is this what CenturyLink was referring to as the Clearview reporting system in the tariff? <clears throat> that, is, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I won't stay on this real long because obviously you can see all the PSAP data here. <clears throat> but what this is saying is that for like Benson Police Department in Arizona, um, they bridged out um, 
calls and when you see a phone number here versus a PSAP, you know, here's one that Camp Verde uh, transferred out a call to Cottonwood Police Department. Um, if you see a phone number there, it's a 10-digit, maybe it's um, oh, a language helpline or <clears throat> I can't think of some of the other ones. It, they're transferring it out to a 10-digit number versus just to another piece. And what it's showing you is the setup time. It just took tens of seconds to set the call up and, and get it over there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the duration of the call, how long that call lasted. So again, this information you can get um, drilled down. Now I'm just going to back up the screen here. Maybe. There we go. It always goes slower when I'm demonstrating, obviously. So here, let's take a look at this one that says the manual bridge type. So that should be a list of those ten of those ten digit numbers um, we saw. I'm going to go down here and grab uh, Utah because it's just a smaller number here. Okay, so here's all the um, calls that were bridged out from in Utah, all the various PSAPs that had had to transfer a call out for whatever reason. And here's, like I indicated before, the language line um, is something that they would manually bridge out, um, and then other 10-digit numbers that are on there as well. And again, it's giving you your setup time and your duration. And so this is what your bridged call summary report would look like. Uh, the next report in your RFP um, was the event count by type. So let me grab that one. Event counts by call type. Kim, real quick on the associated agency, things like language line, is that something that we program in or you automatic? How, how does it know that that's language line? Because I have my own numbers for language line. Yep, you have to tell us what they okay. are. Okay. We get it all, all in. Yep, that's all part of the setup of all of your transfers, your, your um, three digit star codes, um, two digit. Um, transfer codes. Um, most of it's done on the three-digit star codes is how we usually set it up in most of the states. And then you have a list of all the PSAPs in the state. They all have a three-digit star code. So right. Everybody okay. Can. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So this is the event counts by call type. Um, and so that's wireless, wireline, VoIP. Um, and as you can see in in the second column there, it says call type. You know, if it says unknown, it, it probably just tracked that call before we could um, assign it, um, you know, a VoIP or wireless or wireline. Um, and so a lot of times that will change as, as the day goes on. Um, then that data is, is known to our systems and we're able to populate it appropriately. Uh, so in Arizona, they had, um, and this is for day, remember, I just got it clicked on daily up here for the 18th, and this is all GMT time. Uh, Arizona VoIP uh, for the eight, on the 18th, they had 204 um, events total, um, and that's something I should clarify for you as well. We don't track a 911 call. We track an event. And what we mean by that is that PSAP A receives the 911 call, and for some reason they need to transfer it to another PSAP. So that now that's two events for that call. So we track events on everything that occurred with that 911 call. If it's going from PSAP A to PSAP B, and then maybe over to a, a different, um, oh, I don't know, the ambulance system that that you um, that you have, you know, will track all those events. So it doesn't necessarily mean 
ev what I'm saying is event does not equal a call. So uh, for VoIP on the 18th, they had 204 events. 146 of those events was the initial 911 call. Of those, they transferred out 60, and of those, 58 of them were transferred into them. Um, so that's how we keep, a tr keep track of that. Um, again, you can see up here at the top, total events, initial calls, transferred out calls, transferred in calls. They're all highlighted in that uh, blue um, with an underscore. And so let's go ahead and click on initial calls. And you can see the data that's going to come up with that. And it should show us um, the hours of the day. So this is the hourly breakout. So in hour zero, you know, for this first line, two, th those two unknown, they occurred at the zero hour and at the 1400 or 1600 hours. And so then you can see where all of these calls occurred at, what hour of the day they occurred at. And there are not any other drill downs for this. I cannot, at this, on this type of report, I cannot drill down to see the phone numbers. It's just telling you where all your VoIP calls were coming in at, what hour, where your wireless calls were coming in at, and your wire line. Kim, does it break down any further than just VoIP wire line and wireless? Can you look at like all of, all of, the, um, of the type codes? No, no, no. This is the, as far as it goes down. It does not break it down further than that. Okay. And so the same thing, if we would click on transferred out calls or transferred in calls, it's going to bring up uh, those hours of the day and show you where all those calls were at. So there's no way to see like how many of your wireless calls were phase one versus phase two, for instance? That is, cor that is a correct statement. Okay. Okay. Let me go and grab your next report, and that's the event count by routing reason. For a question for CenturyLink, is it since we can't, we can no longer see the breakdown of the classes of service, is it safe to assume that we will continue receiving the alley retrieval reports on a monthly basis? So this is Kim from Entrato. The alley retrieval report will still be a report that's available. Um, and providing that your PSAPs all and I'm not, not quite sure how to word this, are all on their own platform, then we'll be able to be able to send you that type of report. We'll keep that report. Um, okay. Event counts by routing reason. Um, so this is the routing, you know, it was either selectively routed, default routing, it could have been an incoming transfer, uh, and it will also, also show you the destination if that was the primary PSAP. For some reason it was unanswered and it went to another PSAP. Um, and Let's see, you've got your alternate routes, and that's something that we always set up with you at the time that we're setting up your PSAP on all your alternate routes, your abandonment routes. Um, you know, most likely, Ken Van Hout will be your project manager um, for all these setups, um, and he's excellent at um, the work that he does. And so he'll go through all of, the, all of those um, options when we're setting up to um, get you on the ESINET. So again, for these, we have our total events, your initial calls, your transferred out calls, and transferred in calls based on the routing reasons that we, that we have here. 
I'll go ahead and just click on Initial Calls so you get a look at that. Okay, so for Initial Calls, you, you know, we've got your routing reasons over on, on the second column over here on the left-hand side, and then the destination and then the hours of the day that those calls occurred in. And I know I'm going through a lot of this quickly. Um, one thing I will let you know that when PSAPs start, start turning up and using the and want to start using these reports, I do provide other training. Um, I usually have uh, a key Century Link person uh, for the particular state. In this instance, you know Colorado, and. I'll do some training with that person and a few PSAPs, and then as the CenturyLink person is comfortable, then they will continue with the training um, going forward with all the various metric reports. Um, again, I'm always available um, to help out or explain these in, in more detail. And it helps when you can see individual PSAP data as well, um, when you can see your own calls and everything that's happening in your PSAP. So we're moving on to the trunk group, event count by, by trunk group. Um, same layout as before. You know, we've got our Inglewood and Miami um, locations and then the trunk groups that are associated. And again, you, you have your, your same um, drop downs across the top, your total events, your initial calls, your transferred out calls, and transferred in calls. And if I click on any of those, it's going to show you exactly what we um, saw in the last couple reports as it was just broken out by hour. And in this case, it would be depicting the trunk group. So with that, I'm going to move on by event counts Per hour is the next one on your list. Just a quick question about this. Um, so the trunk group code that's there, how does that translate to something in, in the real world that will mean something to us? Is that like a group of different PSAPs, or is that a region, or is that specific to a PSAP? What does that mean? It's going to be by state. Um, and so as we get that data in here for Colorado, we'll be able to explain to you where those trunk groups, um, what PSAPs that they're, they're associated with. But I don't have any Colorado data in here yet, so I can't answer the question for your state. Every state is set up just a little bit differently. Minnesota is set up different than Arizona just because of different contract language gotcha. and different that they've chosen. Yep. But typically one trunk group serves multiple PSAPs? Is right. that a correct statement? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, event count by hour. Event count reports per hour. Let's take a look at that one. And this one's pretty straightforward. This is just going to tell you for your state or, you know, if we had drop down for a PSAP, how many events that you had in it in the hour of the each hour of the day. So that one's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the next one is event count by incoming trunk group. Oh. I think I already did that one. Just a second, let me I grabbed the wrong one. I'm going to have to go back here just a second. Okay, this is a distribution over PTMs. On your RFP, it, it, the name of it is called Event Count by Incoming Trunk. And what is at, what it's actually called in our system is the event distribution over PTMs. So here are PTMs, and again, um, there'll be different ones for your state 
um, as Colorado comes on board. Um, and then again, the, the headings are your total events, initial calls, transferred out, and transferred in. Let's see, what's event setup time is the next one. And this one is going to show us, you know, your statistics on the time to route and deliver the calls uh, for your PSAP. Okay, so here, so this is just a little bit different now. Um, we have our total events, you know, we'll just use Arizona here, it's a little over 5,000. And the average call setup to get that call out to the PSAP was 0.86. Seconds, and it gives you the minimum setup for the calls and the maximum, and then obviously your, your median. Um, but your, here's your average setup for all the states is 0.78. So that just lets you know how quickly the systems work in getting your calls out to your PSAPs. And the last report in your RFP is called the Routing Database Processing. And grab that one. Okay. So the only, let's see, Minnesota, we've got some some activity here as well as North Carolina. So this is just telling us for the November 18th for Minnesota, they had a little over 7,000 calls. Um, they had three that default routed. Um, and so let's take, and three of those were, were no record founds and that's probably why it default routed. Um, so let me click on that number three and, and show you what it's gonna come back with. Okay, so this, don't look too close, this is private data actually, but so on these three PSAPs, um, the call default routed and it does give the calling party number. Um, you know, like I, like I showed you just a second ago that these were no record found. So for some reason, that call was in the data, wasn't in the database and so it default routed to the, to the PSAP name that was listed there. And so that gives you information. Um, I'm going back to the main screen of that. Um, it will give you information on why it default routed. You know, there were 119 in North Carolina. I'm not sure what happened there. North Dakota, there was one that default routed. In Utah, there was five that default routed. And they all indicate no record bounds. Um, so that is something that you can keep track of and make sure that, you know, follow-up is done. I know PSAPs do that um, today, you know, when they get a call in and there's not a record there, they usually make a report via 911 net to um, get that corrected and get the data in there. And it could simply be that a person moved and, the, and it just hasn't caught up with them yet. Um, so those are the eight reports that are in the RFP. We do have other reports um, that are available. Um, I said initially, you know, you can see that there was a whole standard suite of reports here. Um, some of them are better utilized for CenturyLink. Um, some of them are, are uh, more geared towards the PSAPs, and I'm sure that's why they chose the eight um, for RFP. Um, there, we do have custom reports. There's a, uh, a time, this is a peak hour traffic report that a lot of PSAPs and, and states like to see. It's, it's a report that will show you um, if you want to measure when your busiest hour was in a month um, or in several months. I know Minnesota uses this all the time to, to help the PSAPs decide when their business, busiest days were. 
you know, and it's usually a summer month and usually around the 4th of July, um, and it will show exactly um, all the calls and where the peak calls were for wireline versus wireless and VoIP. It will show you, show you all of that data. Um, so that's another good report uh, to keep in mind for, for future. So that's all that I have right now. I just went off what, what Wes wanted me to cover for the eight reports. Um, Kim, we had a question on the chat screen uh, from Lori Pins who says, if a report is needed that by an agency that is not available in the listing, how does the agency get a custom report made? A custom report, you would uh, work that through CenturyLink. Um, you would put in your request to them, and CenturyLink would send that request over to me saying, this is the data that we have. We would um, work with CenturyLink in building and designing that report um, if it doesn't already exist. Sometimes the requests that we get, we find that it can be answered you know, by using a combination of two reports or, or different data. But yeah, we would work, you would work with CenturyLink and CenturyLink would work with me. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Other this questions? Is what, I have a question. Hey, Lori, um, if you're on, what, what do you mean by agencies? Do you mean a sub-agency to Pueblo PD? Or could you clarify for me? Anyhow. I'm just talking about the agency as a whole. Like if uh, uh, Pueblo, say Laura needed a report that we didn't see there, and I just wanted to know how Laura would go about getting assistance for creating that report or whatever. Okay. Now I understand what you meant by it. Now, um, first, for the sake of consistency, we came out with these eight Clearview reports and uh, to deploy those uh, first, and then, of course, we can work down the road to on trying to uh, work with you on custom reports and that sort of thing. So I got it. I mean, I'm not even sure if she would, would need something like that, but I wanted to ask the question since we were going over it. Thank you. Oh, good question. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Kim, this is Daryl. I have a question about how the events are counted because you said the event isn't necessarily a call. An event can be um, whenever something happens to a call. So let's say a PSAP receives a call. They've received the initial call from the public. They transfer that call out to another PSAP that's on the same system. So there's a trans there's an initial call, there's a transfer out, and there's a transfer in. For that PSAP, how many events will show up for that call? Initial and the transfer out will show up, will show up for so the initial. Count as, so that'll count as two events for the first PSAP. Exactly. Okay. So you mentioned that it doesn't that it the events are not necessarily um, one event is not necessarily one call, correct? Correct. So how I I don't think I understand the difference then based on what Daryl just asked you in that answer that was a one to one. So in what case would it not be one to one? No, that was two because you you had the initial. Well, I realize. Call. Right, it said two, and it was two calls. I'm asking, in what case will it not be a one-to-one -one ratio of one event and one call? Maybe I'm misunderstanding right. what you're saying. Yeah, Bruce, I think the way I understood it, and, and Kim, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that actually counted as two events for one call because they received the call, that's one event, and then when they transferred the call out, that was a second event, even though it was, a, it was one 911 call. Correct. Kim, is that right? Okay. That that is correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. That clarifies for me. Thank you. And then, but for the receiving PSAP, that gets counted as a call for them, though too. Oh, right. Correct. Right. It, for the receiving PSAP, that would be one event for them for on their on their scorecard, if you will. Um, and if they just handled the call and didn't transfer, didn't do anything more with it, it would just be one tally on, on their card. If right. you're looking at it from a statewide level, it would count as three because you would have the initial call, the transfer out, and the transfer in. That's three events. That is, that is accurate. And the reason that we kind of stress that 
is because we know a lot of PSAPs want to look at reports and go, okay, for November 18th, we had 27 events, so we had 27 calls. And that's why we say, no, 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 you, you, can't, you can't do that. You know, and a lot of times you utilize that data for um, scheduling people or budgets, whatever it may be. And so that's why we just want to make that very perfectly clear that an event is not equal one 911 call all the time. Right. So for a PSAP wanting to know what their actual call volume was, they would want to look at the initial calls and the transfer in Correct. and not the events. Correct. Because the, because the events can also include transfers out. Yes, correct. Other questions? Kim, this is Wes. Thank you so much. We wanted to uh, roll this out for the entire state. Um, I think it had been reviewed um, some months ago, but uh, now I think people have a, a pretty good idea of the kind of metrics they can get on these Clearview reports, so it's very much appreciated. Thank you. Hey, Kim. Um, my name is Phil. I'm in La Plata County, Colorado. I had a question about, uh, is, can you export um, any of the back-end data on any of these reports um, so oh. that we can manipulate the data ourselves? Yeah, yep, right up at the, can you still see my screen? I can. Okay, right up at the top, it says home page reporting tools to export. So yes, you can, um, let me just grab these, this small area from Minnesota. Oh. Okay, well, you know, I'm really glad that we finished with them when we did because they're they're updating systems. So I, as you can see, it's, I've got currently is being updated, so I can't go in there and do that. But there is the export tab up there that you can export it to Excel, and you can make it also a printer-friendly report as well. So, yes, that, that feature is available. Okay, so if we had that report that showed basically all of the events and we wanted a subset of that, then we could export that data and pare it down ourselves. Yep, exactly. Perfect, thank you. Does it get exported just as a regular Excel file or a CSV file? Um, the drop down says Excel. Um, what, okay. what the printer friendly version is, I, I don't recall, but I know it does go into Excel. Thank you. Other questions? Another thing, well, this is, you know, if you go up here to help if there are any of the reports, um, let me see if I can just get into one of the other ones. Um, No, it's not going to let me in. Okay, um, so if we go up on, if we would go under, if you were in a report and you click the help button, the help button will also bring down an ex, a short explanation of that particular report. If you can't quite remember what all the detail is, it'll give you a short description as well. And we do have a guide that um, explains all the reports. Um, that we've gone over also. Anything else? Uh, so this is a question for CenturyLink. I think more than more than in Toronto, but uh, given sort of a different parallel conversation going on right now regarding the uh, prepaid numbers, um, what would be the possibility of getting me access to this, or at least maybe a, a limited version of the reports to look at um, call type statewide by PSAP, so that we can put that type of thing together instead of trying to use the alley retrieval reports. 
Hey, Tim, this is Wes. Well, we'll have to circle the wagons internally and get back to you on that. I, I can't really answer that off the cuff right now. Okay. okay. Uh, this is Jerry from Summit County. I had a question for Kim. Sure. Uh, do you guys provide uh, an API uh, to extract data, or the only way to export data is through this web interface? Through this web interface. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Kim? Okay, thank you, Kim. Appreciate your time. Uh, Kimberly, next item on the list is the discussions uh, items. Discussion items. Do you want to walk us through that? Absolutely. Well, Thank Kim, you. This is Kimberly. This is Wes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we uh, we also wanted to cover um, questions about monitoring and assurance, and I have a I have a gentleman on standby now to give us a a good high level overview of what our assurance program is and notifications and that sort of thing. Can we go ahead and put him on the line? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that was one of the discussion items, so that works good. Okay. Well, oh, sorry. I can't see your agenda from where no, that's fine. Job. So, Paul? Paul, are you on now? I am on. Folks, this is uh, Paul Brown, one of our internal uh, senior managers for the Assurance Program, which monitors the network and uh, covers things from the quality of assurance and how that happens as well as the um, notifications that would go out either singly to a PSAP or something a more general way uh, to a region, et cetera, whatever might be impacted by an incident. So, so Paul, I'm going to turn this over to you. If you could kindly just kind of give us a high-level overview of what the assurance program is, and I'm sure we'll have a few Q&As afterwards. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. Uh, it's still morning to uh, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Paul Brown. I am in the Public Safety Services Network Operations Center, and uh, I'm located physically here in Minneapolis. And uh, as we do today for your current technology services, we monitor all of your alarms uh, in a real-time basis across multiple channels, and this is not just one um, one center that monitors. We actually work uh, with several departments that monitor the networks, and we have close service level agreements uh, just to take care of today's services. Going forward, we also work with Entrato, a.k.a. West, uh, with Kim Higgs' team, uh, looking at the network in the new network uh, as far as SIP and IP-based services, we have uh, an entire team dedicated to watch those network connections and all the routing equipment associated with NG911. Um, one of the new newer tools that we've deployed is a uh, active assurance probe program that we insert uh, into the network probes that will keep the network basically busy. If we wanted to just use a simple term, we keep the network busy generating test calls through the NG911 network. Um, this helps us, this is one of our key contributors to being in front of issues that help us uh, keep the network reliability uh, on a higher a higher scale. Uh, I don't think you're going to see anyone else that's doing that today for NG911 services. Um, we take these probes, these active assurance probes, and about every, uh, about once a minute, every probe that is deployed within the NG911 network, there are a pair of probes going out into each PSAP because we have redundant paths going out there, each of these probes will get a call about every minute, every 60 seconds. All 
all that information is compiled. Every call that is uh, successful and any calls that fail are all captured, and we will um, correlate those calls into a metric. Based on that metric, if, uh, and I'll give you an example, let's say we have a loss of redundancy or something like that that occurs in the network. Now, when one calls are still working, everybody is just fine, but we happen to be in what's considered a loss of redundancy state, but we're going to let you know about that. You may not have even had an, uh, experienced any problems, but we're going to make you aware of it. And we do this on a fairly timely basis, too. Right now, our current timer is set at about within... 10 to 12 minutes, you're going to know if we're experiencing that situation. We let every piece that is impacted in that condition know about this, this problem. Uh, if the other piece in the network are not impacted, they, they're not going to be disturbed. We also have uh, what's called a, an isolation condition. We'll go ahead and make that information aware to, on a per piece basis immediately. We don't necessarily wait the full 12 minutes. We try to speed that up uh, closer to eight minutes to make the PSAPs aware that the, from what we can tell based on test calls, you may have trouble getting calls into your PSAP. Um, so all of these, you know, these two items and these two steps are one of the more proactive areas that we are pretty proud of ourselves in trying to make sure that we keep the customer communications and the customer experience um, more open and transparent. And then as far as uh, our daily monitoring, our shop is 7 by 24, 365 days a year. We don't take holidays off. We're always available, and just as we take care of every associated piece have today in Colorado, that continues right up through into the new NG911 network. That's really about all that I have. Um, I'll be happy to open it up to questions specific to monitoring or to uh, service assurance if anyone has anything. So I'm sure I know the answer to this, but just to clarify, when you talk about having a program on the network that does test calls to identify problems, those are test calls that are internal to the network components. They're not actually going to a PSAP or generating calls to a PSAP, correct? Actually, <clears throat> this uh, it's a good question, by the way. These test calls do traverse the same path that a real 911 call will take. We have probes placed at each PSAP, <clears throat> a pair of probes, excuse me. <clears throat> These probes will, um, the routers will send the calls to the probe specifically and not to the PSAP, uh, not to the gotcha. call taker position. Gotcha. So if you're also concerned about whether or not you're going to get stats showing increased volume, like what Kim was just showing, um, that should not be included in your stats. Right, because it's never actually hitting the CPE. Correct. Any other questions or comments, uh, maybe especially from our technical experts that are on the line? This is... Kimberly, I just, I guess I get concerned when we start handling these calls in an IP world about jitter and latency. And so your network monitoring, you're monitoring and you're really diving into that type of call quality. Is that what I'm understanding? So you're going to be able to that know is correct. not just about policing on the network, but it's more about, and you're not just looking at drop packets, but really that call quality of, of the connection. That's a very good question, Kimberly. We do monitor quality of service. Okay, we have the criteria for quality of service will be jitter, it'll be latency, it'll be packet loss. We actually report, we have a threshold set on what is considered an acceptable level in the IP world, what is considered an acceptable level of a good call. Anything below that, we report on it, and we're not only reporting on it, but we're also addressing it. 
So yes, we do look at the quality of service. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is uh, Jerry. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jerry. No, so um, I had a question about when you guys monitor the monitor the equipment. Are you monitoring each segment, each endpoint? And then the other question is, do you, what's your SLA in accordance to, or were you willing to share your SLAs? So, for example, if you do notice jitter or latency on a certain segment or to a certain PSAP or a certain router, do you guys have an SLA for that versus a different SLA for um, a system completely down? So do you have different tiers of how you respond to each one of those uh, problems? That's that's a good question. Yes, we do. The SLAs that we have for quality of service or MOS, the MOS scores, um, today, based on what the PSAPs have been requesting, we can set up, uh, thank you for presenting that, uh, whomever's presenting that screen. We have the packet loss, um, the, the MOS scores, latency, all of that will come back into our network, and we're going to look at it and determine whether or not we actually have a problem. If we do, in fact, have a problem, then we start interacting with our other departments to to troubleshoot this and find out what's going on. And we'll, then we'll also take appropriate measures. That includes if the calls cannot be cleared up in a uh, reasonable time, we're going to uh, the calls can be shifted over to the, the normal process that you have today, We'll send the calls over to another PSAP so that we don't lose that uh, the the quality of service. If uh, and then we have uh, timelines built in for the quality of service. Let's say it's and I think that's two and twenty two minutes. We get uh, alerts and that's sampled over a, a twelve minute period. Uh, that's the type of review that we do, uh, the in-depth review that we're doing on the on the uh, the call itself, not just the line it, itself. If the um, if the call is is good, we're fine. We don't do anything. We don't try to. We, we won't insert a you know any our noses into the equipment where there's no problem. If there's a problem, then we do have to meet our FCC regulations, which is to notify the impacted PSAPs of a situation, uh, an outage, and we follow those FCC guidelines, just as we do today. Um, I had another question. So it seems like, um, and thanks for showing that, Daryl, uh, and I apologize. I guess I should have known that. Um, the question I had is, uh, at what point do you guys call a different team, like the security team? So this is for packet loss. What if there's too many packets? So in the case of potentially a CP from a certain uh, PSAP is actually trying to put too many information on on the line. Um, so what I'm trying to refer to as is a potentially a DOS denial service attack from a particular PSAP or a distributed denial service attack. <clears throat> yes, we do have uh, our teams that monitor the equipment will look for, um, they, they look at capacity. Uh, we're getting the scores reported to us in a different sense, but we do have a team that is also monitoring that, and they are set up as 911 uh, to react specifically to the 911 customers and will uh, address those, uh, those individual situations that come across them. Typically, they'll look at it from the interface perspective. They won't look at it out on the trunk. They'll look at it from the router interface perspective to see whether or not they have a DDoS occurring. But they also expect to see our test calls coming through there. So we know that there are PSAPs that may get half a dozen calls a day in 24 hours. But in the meantime, we've sent uh, one call every minute for a 24-hour period across that Link so they understand those values coming across, and and they'll they'll be looking at uh, at the QoS at the interfaces. So okay, they do see you. that. Now we do, and we do also intercommunicate between our uh, our center as well as those other operating departments very closely, and they are also providing support to us 
on a uh, seven by twenty four basis or on a on call basis as necessary. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. This is Ed Roth with Lita. I have a, a question. Are you, yes, can sir. you hear me? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, do we have uh, any reporting or insight into these metrics that you collect uh, either by that attached device or uh, I think you mentioned potentially it's another group that kind of monitors the interface and the, the router level connectivity and metrics? Uh, do we do we provide insight uh, like what reports or something? Yes, um, when we had most circuits, we had kind of a dashboard that would show bandwidth utilization and packet loss, et cetera. We can certainly entertain that. Uh, we we are working on some other uh, transparent uh, items such as what you're asking for, but right now we don't have that. Uh, we're not offering that, but we are looking at offering something that that can probably address your specific question, uh, and that is being uh, the development. I don't mean just talking to talk; it's uh, talking in terms of development. Daryl, can you to scroll try to address down? Those. Can you scroll down to item three there, where it talks about reporting in support of the above service quality objectives? I just wanted to read that section. Thank you. Yeah, I, I recall this as well, Kimberly, and I think uh, I, I think what this calls for is not necessarily real time, but quarterly reports. Right. So some some way to report. I mean, a dashboard like Ed mentioned would be awesome. So an uh, authority or a PSAP could just have eyes on the network, even though we know CenturyLink is monitoring everything real time. Is just always nice to. Mm -hmm. to see that, but even being able to get those reports of the network, not just so much about your volume, but the health of the network and delivery. In some cases, we do get, uh, Kimberly, good question. Uh, in some cases, we do get requests for, you know, trunk reports. So I've received some from, I think it was Pueblo and a couple of other PSATs asking for their uh, EM trunks and the utilization, um, we can provide that on a request basis. And, uh, but then to the other point, yeah, we are working on a, a dashboard. So that is, in, that is like I said, uh, we are in discussing the design of that. Will it be ready by the time we're cutting over and, and able to offer that uh, by next year? I don't think so. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any further questions? Comments? Well, if there's nothing else, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, thanks for trusting CenturyLink, and I hope you all have a, a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much, you Paul. Bet. Appreciate it. You bet. Okay, Kimberly, back to you. Okay, fantastic. So the spreadsheet that we have up that we're looking at has been updated from our meeting last week. So if we scroll yep, to the top, um, if you want to take a look at this right now, it's unfiltered, but you can always filter it so you're not looking at the items we've already resolved. And if you're having a hard time reading it because it's it's been crossed out, all you have to do is just uncheck that box. But if you do that, if you can just please, if it's one that we've handled and discussed and we consider it complete, just make sure you recheck it again. Um, so the intent of this section of the agenda is to just go through the items that we haven't discussed or that are still open with CenturyLink. And this item of um, all the stats we reviewed today. And so this is item number seven. And I'm gonna go ahead and Mark, this is complete. Now, as you have conversations internally, if you feel you've got more questions about monitoring, obviously just um, let us know and we'll go through that. And then the next item is for Montrose. Wes, you already touched on this today. 
you're just working on that exact date and get getting that schedule updated. So um, that's still open on our sheet. Yes, ma'am. I will. I'll be able to finish that when I uh, drive back tonight and get back online too. And I want to also talk with Pueblo PD personally as well, and then I'll confirm all that. Okay, perfect. And I have that one listed as well as item 22. And then the next piece we have that we just added today was from Aurora, and it's about that equipment and the dates. And so as soon as we can get those dates and close this out and Aurora feels comfortable with the delivery of all of that, we'll mark it off. But we'll track that item here. And then um, in our meeting last week, CenturyLink promised to provide a document with the space electrical requirements, so just a, a one-page document because we had things in kind of separate formats, whether it was listed on a PowerPoint or on a on the PSAP survey, but you guys were going to go ahead and provide that one space doc a one page document about space electrical requirements. So that's an open item and I believe um, Kevin said he would take that. And it's already created to me. I have to find it. We do have a document. Yeah, we do. I I just don't think we could put our fingers on it last week. So Kevin, I, I, I will look for it. Put, keep my name on it. I will find it. Kevin's item is how it's listed. So it's all you. Um, if we could get that before the end of the week, that would be great because I, I don't think you are recreating anything. I just think we all need to find it and make sure it's all on a one page document. Would it be doable to have it by Friday? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm browsing right now to see if I can find it quickly. Quicker is even better. Um, we also received a couple of questions from Brett's as it relates to diversity, and those just came in email while we were on the call. So, Patty, did you want to talk through these items? Patty may have had to drop off. Okay, so Kimberly, I think it would be fine if we want to open, even though Joe's not a voting member, but these are Brett's items if we wanted to open the floor to him since he was the one that sent the email. Okay, fantastic. Joe, are you still on the call? Joe called and left me voicemail earlier while we were on the call, so I don't think he's I don't think he's on the webcast. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, this has a specific question that has to do with um, demarcation points over the CAMA circuits and as it relates to path diversity. So it's being displayed right now. I don't know if Tim or Wes or somebody wants to, to take this and talk through it or if you want to wait until we actually have Brett's on the phone. Yeah, I'm just now reading it, Kimberly, uh, okay. scrolling down. I think part of what we uh, that pertains to this is what we touched on at the beginning of the call about uh, they are digital spans for one and that we want to continue with that. I'm, I'll defer to Kevin since we're already deploying the design and planning for Bretza there. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to use my old Evelyn Wood speed reading course here to, to read both of these things here to answer it right. But uh, Kevin, have you had a chance to read these two things that came in from Bretza? Would you like to address those? I have not read them. She said they came in while we we're on this call. I've not read them. Right, I read them. The if what what Joe describes there as last mile diversity isn't what I would describe as last mile diversity. Well, we we do have resilient diversity paths going to both nodes for Bretza, uh, and of course yesterday we were out there, our, our tech was out there meeting with Joe Humble, to validate that we've got that diversity to the to the handoff there up on the second floor. So right, so uh, we have diverse. So what 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 he says there is is that we can we can deliver and they can deliver and dynamically route to various locations, but for each location, there's not there's not a uh, diverse path for that last mile. Now the the fact that they have different locations that they, that they can deliver to and we can do that creates diversity in our delivery path to them but it is not what I would call last mile diversity because still the link from the central office to any of one of those locations is just 
that one location. So maybe it's a difference in terminology or something like that. So that's probably why it bears better or more uh, discussion with uh, Bretta when they're present. Now, I, I think, go ahead, Kimberly. I was just wondering if CenturyLink would take both of these questions and then provide back a written response, even if you need to get on a separate conference call with Bretza, if we could get a written response and we can just tag it into the spreadsheet. This is, we did talk about copper, legacy copper T1 facilities. I think, you know, you've talked through that earlier, mm -hmm. but if you could just provide a formal response back so everyone can see that and track along with it. So if they have a similar question, we have we can answer it. We will do that. Okay. Um, and can we we'll tag have, this for yeah. uh, Kevin today? So 1127? I think that would be sufficient. Kevin, will that be sufficient for you? I, I need to look into this in detail and see what it is. And it's, I'm not Hold sure on, it's 11. Really technical as far as base. I think it's more of a partly, mostly the, um, just by what I'm looking at, a tariff base type thing. I mean, and what we're doing. Right. I think this bears conversation with, uh, I don't know if a, if a written response at this point is the right path because I don't, I don't understand exactly what his question is because he's, because was, I understand the second question, but the first question, I don't because the terms, you know, last mile path diversity, he's using differently than I would use them. So I want to make sure that our answer meets his question. And right now my thinking of his question is probably different than he thinks of his question. So we're probably not going to match up there. So we need some more discussion with him. Second thing is, we're meeting next Wednesday? No, we're not meeting next Wednesday. It's just for a written response back so we can um, no. put it in the document. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay, so uh, we will slide that dead. But Kimberly, your suggestion I think is optimal. What CenturyLink will do, we'll uh, circle the wagons with Bretza in real time to make sure that we fully understand the intent of what these questions are. And then we can respond back, I think, more accurately. So, Tim, are you saying we can't have a written response at all, or you're just saying that we can't get that together by the 27th? I wouldn't want to promise anything um, by November 27th. Okay. I don't know what folks are going to be doing next week. Uh, that's a good point. It's a short week. Kimberly, can you, can we leave that open uh, uh, for now for that date until uh, we get with our planners and have that discussion with Bretza directly? Because, yeah, I, I mean, the first thing is that I need to understand exactly what Joe was at. I like having the power of assigning dates. And I'm just joking. Yes, I can. Yeah. I can slide <laughs> that. And I'll, okay. I'll reflect. Yes, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> Eleven twenty seven. Kimberly, you said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> that that was intentional. Um, yeah. So so I'll flag uh, that, and then I understand you need to have additional conversation with Brett yeah. to get your arms around their their question, and then once you're able to do that, we'll just flag that response in here as well, so, so we all have visibility. Okay. Right, so date TBD. And the item will stay on the discussion list, you know. So we, we we're not going to drop it. We'll we'll circle back around to it if, if nothing else by the next uh, users group meeting. Keeping in mind that Brett is one of the first ones to transition. So I think that's all of the items that we have for the spreadsheet. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling, quite frankly, Kimberly, that after we go one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with Joe and the group there, that he might retract the question because I think it, it might be evident that it, it's being done and answered appropriately. That's but great. Anyway. Yep. Does anybody have any other items they want to add or present to CenturyLink to get tracked on this document? So this, this list of um, smaller items that we had from City of Pueblo that all came in at once, those all, we were com comfortable with all of those being answered. 
Well, actually, we're going to add we're going to add two of those. Uh, I was kind of standing up and doing those on an ad hoc basis, and there is uh, more deeper dive things that I'll get with Nancy. We can add those two there as well. There's there's additional technical questions that will can enhance that. Well, and we talked through them at our meeting last week, and I haven't received anything back from the city of Pueblo. Do we have them on the call today to make sure they feel that their questions have been answered before you provide further detail, Wes? City of Pueblo's on. Um, we actually have more questions coming, but we're waiting for uh, the approval of moving our uh, cut date. So we're kind of in a holding pattern until we hear back from Wes on that cut date. Um, the answers that you had given last week, we don't have any additional uh, clarification that we need at this time, and we're simplifying um, some of the other questions since we are just getting involved in this at a deeper level. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, but we still have some pending questions. Okay. Lori, th this is Wes. How about I, I can call you tomorrow? Will that work for you? We can maybe uh, go over this and that date. That would be great. I'd like to coordinate with Laura um, and make sure that she's available as well. Laura has been left off of this invite, so I just forwarded it over to her. But, yeah, that would be great, Wes, if we can get with you on some of this, and it may be interesting for the other folks as well. Very good. Okay, so a couple of pieces on that. If you want to send those questions over to me or Bruce or both of us, and we can get them inputted in this. So um, the questions you have, many of us may have the same questions. So it's helpful that we can track them here. And yeah, um, well, we plan on doing that, um, okay, sending them to Daryl and everybody as well. So uh, we will get followed up on that. Okay, and then to the point of anybody who's not getting emails or not part of the group, and Daryl, I don't know if you're going there now, but there's a way to subscribe to those. So a little bit is you may have more than just one or two people internally that you want to have access or know where to find the information or to get the meeting invites. And so there's um, group pages that have been set up and a website that specifically you can subscribe to the different groups. Actually, I was just going to go check and see if Laura's on there right now, because if she is, there may be a different reason why she's not getting, did I spell that yeah, right? We, we got added to all kinds of things that, you know, real quick, and uh, we're, we're still trying to get our heads wrapped around all the different groups, but she was just in my office and was unaware of this particular meeting. She's been on the other ones, but this one she did not receive an invite for. Okay. It looks like she didn't get on the ESI Net Users Group, but I can add her. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So I think from the discussion items spreadsheet, Bruce, we are complete with that item. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and I think the last, uh, or I'm sorry, the last thing for the voting members is open discussion. Anything else that we need to bring up uh, today before we move into public comment? Okay, uh, so we're now going to open the floor for public comment. Are there any non-voting members on the call that would like to uh, bring something up for discussion or may have questions? <laughs> Nothing heard, so I think that that means we are finished with our meeting today. And Daryl, what do you have the date of the next meeting? Just so. Uh, so yeah, it would be the third Wednesday, or is it? Yeah, the second Wednesday would be the pre-meeting. That's the 11th at 10 a.m. and the um, the 18th would be the uh, full meeting at 10 a.m. to okay. noon. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time, and, and uh, please have a great Thanksgiving and bundle up for this snowstorm that's coming. All right. Thank you so much, Bruce and everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, everyone.